I'll tell you something I've been thinking about lately, friends. I've been thinking about going back to being a brunette. As you can tell, my natural color is obviously not blonde. It is brunette. And I've been blonde for a long time. But I'm considering going back. And I feel like if I go back, it's going to be like a permanent move. And I don't know what to do about it. Mostly, I think that my hairstylist will be upset. <laughs> I don't want to tell her. Hello, Bibliophiles. My name is Jill, and I'm here to do my October wrap-up today. I was considering just not doing it this month, but no, I want to be consistent, and I really would like to have, I think, a record of my, all of my wrap-ups of the whole year on my channel, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. Um, the reason I was considering not doing it is because I, I was thinking I didn't have any books I really liked this month, but I did. I've kind of had a couple I really enjoyed. Mostly, though, I just felt pretty mediocre about October as a reading month just generally. You know I read I think I read nine books which is you know a lot of books. The first one I'll talk about is The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by uh you know Taylor Jenkins Reid. I both listened to this partly in audio and also read a physical copy of it. I have to say I really liked the audio I thought it was well done but I, I think I just preferred reading the physical copy of this book because it went so fast. It was a very very fast read and this is my first Taylor Jenkins Reid um, you know, exactly what I thought it was going to be. It was fast, it was entertaining, I thought it was, you know, relatively well written. This book was exactly what I thought it was going to be, and I guess that's also because, like, I was well prepped for it. Everyone on the internet has talked about this book, so it wasn't like I was going in even remotely blind. I truly don't have a lot to say about this book that you haven't already heard from someone else. Uh, I didn't think it was the best book of all time. Some people will give it a book five stars. I don't understand why. I mean, it's not that good. <laughs> It's just good. Like, it's a decent read. I'd recommend it to almost anyone. I almost feel like the journalist slash narrator person who was writing the story of Evelyn Hugo was an unnecessary conceit to that book. I think it would have been just as successful, but maybe even more so, uh, if it had been, like, the undiscovered diaries or something of Evelyn Hugo or, like, the undiscovered tapes of Evelyn Hugo or something like that, where it wasn't a third person that was, like, in pulling the story out of her. It was just, like, her story. I don't think you needed the extra person to, like, the, to kind of move the story forward but yeah you know glad I read it glad I read a Taylor Jenkins read a small part of me was hoping I'd be like enraptured by Taylor Jenkins read and like she'd be a new favorite author and I'd be swept away forever by her writing that didn't happen but I did enjoy it and uh you know I wouldn't hesitate to read something else by her if I wanted something like kind of quick and and the same kind of experience I had reading this book next I listened to an audiobook I think for the first time ever a short story collection uh which I enjoyed the experience of listening to a short story collection I didn't necessarily love this one. This is The Secret Lives of Church Ladies by, and I can't remember the author's name, but it's on the screen here. This has won a bunch of, I think it won the National Book Award. Everyone's talked about it. I'm not the first person to mention the short story collection. And I'm really glad, honestly, that I did not buy a copy of this book because I did not love this book. I didn't hate it. And I definitely, I just feel really like whatever about this book, very medium about this book. And I think in large part, my relationship with this book is a struggle with the conceit of this book. The writing was was fine pretty good in some parts I thought the stories some of them were some of them were better than others as every short story collection but I was so frustrated with like the title you know the secret lives of church ladies I'm excited to see what interesting secrets these people have like what does this mean the secret lives of church ladies and it is so forgive my French boring that the first three stories were all about like illicit sex affairs like boring so expected not creative not interesting same old story we've heard a thousand times like nothing about it. it just like it was so boring to me there's some queer stories in here and there's a story about like a pastor and his illicit affair and like i don't know man like it's all very pedestrian to me it didn't feel interesting or new or like nothing about it was at all intriguing to me so i'm really glad i didn't buy a copy of this book i feel like i'm the only person to ever talk about this book who did not like rave and rave and rave about it but you know if you want to find a glowing review they're all over uh youtube so you can go find one um it just wasn't a book for me i have seven books left should i go over the ones i didn't like first and then the ones i did like what do you think let's go on the ones i didn't like because uh i'll go through them pretty fast um i read for my book club the dark library by cyril martinez translated by joseph patrick stancil this is a book that i bought from my local bookstore uh like right before the pandemic i was just in the bookstore one day just browsing and i picked up i just saw this and i picked it up i didn't know anything about it on the back it says in cyril martinez's library the books are alive not just their ideas or their stories but the books themselves and it kind of goes on a little bit and now now that i've read the book i understand what the back means but reading it separate from reading the book is kind of like what is this talking about this book is super strange i didn't like it or dislike it really i just kind of felt nothing about it this is i don't even know how to describe you what this book is i feel baffled by it even after having read it it's 
from the perspective of one man who walks into this like this great library which is what I think like I don't know if it's supposed to be sim symbolical metaphorical if it's actually like referencing a library in Paris like I have no idea it's kind of a social commentary book it's also a kind of philosophy book it's kind of a literary criticism book there's a talking book who kind of narrates the downfall of libraries and reading and I don't know it's a weird book I'm just gonna say don't seek it out. <laughs> this might be appealing to you if you're in university studying literary criticism or studying philosophy but I think ultimately I, I think this should probably just stay on the shelf. I decided to reread Fun Home, Alison Bechtel's uh, graphic memoir. I read this a couple of years ago. Well more than that. 10 years ago maybe? I don't know. When I originally read this I didn't love it. I remember struggling a bit with the content and I just was kind of feeling baffled by how many people like raved and raved about this book. Also somebody commented on my video about Janet McCurdy referencing this as a trauma memoir and I had kind of not thought of it in that way so I wanted to read it again to kind of you know think about that. I had the same problem this book this time around as I had last time around. I really struggle with books that reference classic literature and classic philosophy and kind of um, like traditional writings that like I just haven't read or engaged with at all. It really alienates me from the text and anyone who references Proust this much it makes me not like the text at all. So because this book is so heavily focused on Proust and also Ulysses, two things I haven't read will never likely read or very unlikely I'll ever read these things. Um, I just really did I couldn't enjoy it like I couldn't connect with it at all because even though the ideas are I guess universal in some capacity by using these as like anchor points it's just so alienating i really d struggle with it I w and i want to like it more than i do because i think i have you know an affection and a respect for alison bechdel as most of us i think probably do but i just i really struggle with this book it really kept me at arm's length and i just like couldn't really connect with it so yeah i'm confirmed that it's not a book i love and the last book that i didn't really love this month is billy ray belcourt's book a minor course billy ray belcourt is a canadian indigenous writer and this is his first fiction um, he's a poet. He's written kind of a memoir before called A Memoir of My Brief Body, and which I have but haven't read yet. And this is an autofiction, which is a kind of writing I don't really get along with. So this is largely why I didn't get along with this book. I also think this book is kind of... This book feels unfinished to me. This book feels like it wasn't ready to be published. I almost feel like he had a deadline to publish something and he like passed this in and like it wasn't complete. And the reason I... And I, this is not to like throw shade, but like I genuinely feel like this book um has no direction it has no purpose and like part of the problem is the the kind of conceit of this book is that the narrator main character is or you know Billy Ray Belcourt himself is in his PhD program trying to finish his PhD but he's really struggling to finish his thesis really struggling with like the idea of like academia generally so instead he decides to try to write a novel and to do that he decides to go back home from Edmonton to like up north to a smaller town and kind of talk to family and friends and kind of piece together a novel but the thing is he doesn't have a point of the novel so mostly it's just him being like I want to write a novel and then talking to like friends and talking about like memories that he's had with certain people and that's that's all it is there's nothing else comes of it there's no overarching kind of theme or motif mostly it's like he's like I don't know what I want to do that's it and I just feel like it's just a half it's a half formed thought really the, so there's some parts that are beautifully written, like really beautiful lyrical writing. I think that Billy Ray Belcourt will write a beautiful, wonderful novel someday, but it is not this one. Um, I did a podcast with my friend Alex from the Hamilton Review of Books podcast where we talked about uh, book prizes, but also autofiction, and we talked about this book specifically. So if you want to listen to us talk about this book and talk about book prizes and let us be a bit salty, uh, I would love for you to listen to it. I had a lot of fun recording it and I think you'd really enjoy listening to it so I'll leave the link down below if you want to give it a try. Let's talk about the books that I enjoyed this month. I read another Agatha Christie. I read 450 from Paddington. Somebody in my comments in my last video said that this was originally called What Miss Mag Mrs. McGillicuddy Saw with an exclamation mark which is a great title <laughs> I think it's better than this title um, but this is all, you know a solo good title. Uh, this is about uh, Mrs. McGillicuddy is on a train, the 450 from Paddington, to go meet her friend Miss Marple and she witnesses a murder through the window on a train like on the tracks across from her like a different train she sees a murder happen and she tries to report it and basically like police are like well we can't do anything about that. <laughs> There's no body. All we have is like what you think you saw basically. So of course her friend Miss Marple is on the case. This is one of my favorite Christie's I've read. I thought the writing was excellent. The It's really funny. Parts of this have me laughing out loud. The characters in this book are really strong. The setting is really good. It's just a really enjoyable uh, Agatha Christie mystery so would recommend this one. Also this month I finally finished reading this poetry collection by Louise Gluck. This is all of her published works. The 
1962 to 2012. Uh, this I took me months to read. I started reading it in June or July and I finished it in this month and I have to say what an interesting fantastic experience to read someone's entire body of work you know in a short period of time a couple of months. It's a lot easier to do with poetry I think than we do with novels or you know non-fiction works but this book uh, in general like how, you know, I don't know how to talk about this massive, like 600 something poems, you know, in one video, but I really enjoyed the process of reading this book. I think ultimately Louise Clark poetry is just kind of not 100% for me. It largely is the theme she kind of talks about. She really uses a lot of imagery of flowers and of nature and not nature as in like, not like Mary Oliver uses nature, but the kind of very specific types of trees and flowers, like by name and by like color and shape and stuff. And also a lot of like mythology and um, kind of classic literature, again, just things I, I struggle with generally. So because that's a lot of her reference points for a lot of her images and her kind of narrative structures, it just isn't 100% for me. But there are some poems in here that just like blew me away, like some that made me cry. I think maybe my favorite collections in here um, were Ararat from 1990 and maybe also um, Meadowlands from 1996 and maybe also Vita, Vita Nova. Uh, were kind of my favorite collections. I don't know if I'd recommend everyone read this entire collection of poetry, but I think I would recommend the reading experience of reading one poet's entire uh, body of work because it is really satisfying and it is really nice to see like the the arc of someone's uh, work over over many many years. So yeah, a really wonderful reading experience overall and like one of the highlights of my reading year I think. The last two books are my best books of the month as well as their in contention for the best books of the year. So let's talk about First Stasi Land by Anna Funder. This is Stories from Behind the Berlin Wall. Wow, this book is so excellent. And reading this, I remembered, it's been a while since I've read kind of some Soviet history, some Eastern European history, uh, some German history. And this reminded me why I love reading it so much. It's so interesting. It's so complex. I really connect to these stories. And also because since I haven't read anything about Berlin since I've been to Berlin, reading this now having been there and having kind of, I mean, I was only there for a couple of days, but having a better sense of like where the wall actually was and having a sense of the city is just so much more impactful. So <laughs> go to Berlin if you can, I guess. So Anna Funder, the author of this book, went to Berlin shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall. I think it was 1994 and the wall fell in 89. So it was not too long after and she starts meeting people who have stories about their experience with the Stasi and Stasi were the secret police or basically people who were spying <laughs> on all the citizens in East Berlin. What I love about this book is that it shows the tension between people who still kind of revere the state and I think people to this day, some people who are still alive, still revere the Soviet state as as they have an affection for it in a way that they do not have for what has come since. And that's a different story for a different day perhaps, but I love seeing that kind of perspective of people who um, were mourning the loss of this particular way of life, even though it was like a very difficult way of life because people were constantly sur surveilling you for everything. You could be arrested for things that you didn't even know that you had done anything wrong and like people could just make up lies about you. Like your neighbors could make up a lie about you and report you to the Stasi and then you'd be arrested and like interrogated. Especially towards the end of the GDR, the German Democratic Republic, things are getting really tense and like really difficult. And this kind of looks a lot at younger people who had that experience uh, of not actually trusting the state, but like when they have that moment of like where you're, any illusion you had where you trusted the people in authority is gone. Those stories are really heartbreaking and also really complex and really interesting to read. So not only are these stories like devastating and heartbreaking and like frightening and super interesting and complex, but they're also really well written. Anna Funder is a great storyteller. And I think this book is particularly effective because she talks about her own experience visiting the, uh, I was gonna say GDR, no, visiting Berlin post-wall uh, and, and her kind of experience of seeing what the city is like now that it's integrated. Being an outsider kind of gives her that extra, I don't know, the je ne sais quoi that gives her a set of eyes that are able to kind of comment on things that perhaps someone who lived in the city before and after wouldn't be able to necessarily comment on. So I just thought this was excellent. This was one of my top books of the year. I really loved it. And the last book and one of the best short story collections I've read this year, Learning to Talk by Hilary Mantel. Oh, rest in peace, Larry Mantel. She died earlier this year and this was published uh, a couple months before she died. This collection of short stories is partly autobiographical and she talks about that in the preface to these stories and kind of explains in what ways they're relevant to her own life or kind of where she's pulled elements from her own life to tell these stories. And again, I think I said in my last video, like Hilary Mantel is just one of the best writers of all time in the English language. I just don't, 
and she's just incomparable like nobody writes like she does she has this way with sentence structure that is just unmatched nobody thinks and writes like she did and I loved the short story collection I it is even like less about the stories themselves and then just like spending time with her language everything I've read by her feels both new and fresh in the way that the sentence is structured but also ancient in that she feels like she has this connection through history and through time that all of her stories are anchored in the past it's just she is just singular there's nobody like Hilary Mantel and what a great loss to the literary community and I um, feel really really sad that she will not give us anything else but I do have a couple books left by her that I haven't yet read which I will savor over time and just you know devour and enjoy and I just you know I love this short story collection and I love Hilary Mantel and I'm deeply sad that she is gone but grateful that she was here to give us these amazing pieces of art. I don't know why October felt like such a flat reading month for me when I read some good stuff I think maybe it was just I was so distracted by so many other things in October that I just couldn't really focus uh, as much as I normally do on my reading. Um, but anyway, that's what I read. I would love to know what you read in October. Uh, let me know your hits, your misses, what you liked and what you didn't like. As always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you soon. Bye!